stand up. We're going to be uh, reading from, we're going to pray, and if you can remain standing, we'll read from God's Word together. Let's do that. Father God, thank you so much, Lord, for this morning that we can come and just worship you. Thank you, Lord, as great words of the songs we sang today. Thank you, Lord. Everything is new because of the cross of Christ. Because you conquered death, Lord, we have new hope. We have freedom. Thank you, Lord, what was shared today, Lord, for the communion time, what we have in store for us beyond anything we can imagine, beyond any Mother's Day luncheon imaginable. The banquet hall in heaven is going to be incredible. We can't even imagine it. All because of Jesus. So right now, Lord, as we prepare, as we, well, prepare our hearts and minds, we get into your word. We pray, God, you would speak to us today. That we would hear Jesus Christ today. That you would talk to us loud and clear. And may we honor you, Lord, in every way. Lord, thank you for your forgiveness, God. Thank you because of Jesus we could, we're forgiven every time in every way. That's just incredible. What a blessing. So pray, bless this moment right now. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be reading from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully care of the ministry God has given you. All right. Thank you. you may be seated. Oops, here we go. Um, today we're going to be talking about last, living last day lives through passionate sharing of Jesus. We've been in a series um, called Living Last Day Lives where we've been looking at various scriptures and just, that describe what it will look like shortly before Christ returns. And then we, um, our goal is, and we, we've been looking at that and looking at various events and seeing how they kind of compare. And we're saying, you know what? It looks a lot like what's going to be when Jesus is supposed to come back again. And so that being the case, obviously we want to uh, be prepared and ready for when he comes back, right? We want our lives to reflect what he wants to see in us when he comes back. And so that's what we've been focusing on. Each week we've been looking at a different characteristic. The Bible specifically says God wants to see in our lives when Christ comes back as we live these last day lives for him. And so um, we focused a lot we took uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 4, and then we took a little diversion at, at 1 Peter 4. Now we're back at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5 again, kind of our key verse. And, uh, and that's where our focus has been today. And the whole goal of God wants us to really be focusing on what it means to share Jesus. You see, sharing Christ, and this is what he's talking, Paul's talking to Timothy, sharing Christ is really the key work uh, that he wants to see us in our last days. It's the most important work. Sharing Christ as we wait for Christ's return. So we'll be talking about that and reason why for that. But we'll also give you five steps in, in order to help us do that in these last days. There's a, supposedly I was reading about this uh, cemetery in Indiana. It has a tombstone that's over 100 years old. And it has this written, this epitaph written on it. It says this. Pause, stranger, when you pass me by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. <laughs> kind of a morbid thing there, right? Well, evidently somebody saw that and wrote, back, wrote underneath the epitaph. And they wrote this. Some unknown passerby said this. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> Amen to that, right? <laughs> and of course, that just underscores the importance of what we're talking about today. The importance of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in these last days. If you think about it, um, whether uh, God calls us home first or we are here when Jesus returns, either way, our time in this life as we know it has an expiration date, doesn't it? And so it's obviously important that we are ready for when that expiration date occurs. And what our goal is, of course, through this whole time is, okay, Lord, what do you want us to look like? And, and also, how do you want others to be ready for you? And there's no greater need, of course, than sharing Jesus. 
You know, I think it's really interesting. In our current passage in 2 Timothy chapter 4, um, Paul is speaking urgently to Timothy. He knows that his time in this life is short. In fact, this some might say this might be the last book, 2 Timothy, that Paul wrote. This, you know, it could be whether Titus or 2 Timothy. You know, different people have different thoughts. But it's certainly one of the last and not the last book he wrote. He knew his time was short. And so, in fact, the very next two verses after verse 5, the context says this. Look at me at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have remained faithful. Paul knew his time of death was drawing near. In fact, he wanted to convey that his fate was standing before a judge was in God's hands. He'd already had, he was in the process of a trial going on. He already stood before a judge and it wasn't looking good. He said all of his friends had abandoned him. So all he, all he had was Jesus. He said, but Jesus is on my side. This is a little bit later in chapter 4 here, Second Timothy. He said, but Jesus is on my side and, and, and I was able to proclaim the full gospel and f- with everybody there. So here, Paul's on trial for his life, but in reality, he was still trying to give eternal life for those who are listening. He used the opportunity to share Jesus. And he said, but you know what? God's protecting me. And when it happens, it'll be... It, my life won't be taken against, you know, against God's will. It'll only be in accordance with what God is ready to take me home. But he knew his time was short and he had finished the race and that was all good. And he was ready. He wasn't worried. He wasn't concerned about his situation. He knew where he's going. But he, nonetheless, he knew his time was short. He knew, he, didn't have much, he knew that the time he had left was precious, and so he wanted to see Timothy again. He said that a little bit later in this chapter. And he wanted to communicate to Timothy, because he didn't know if he would have for sure see him or not, what was most important. That's these last two chapters. Think about this for a moment. You ever been with somebody when they're in the hospital and they know God's about ready to call them home? Because I have. Maybe they called them home when you were there. I've had that as a pastor. More than one occasion. And you know those moments are the most important, most urgent to that person that God's calling home. I mean, Jesus, we've been reading, uh, actually, believe it or not, what our brother Greg read today. In John 14, that was a moment that Jesus was having with his disciples. He knew his time was short. He said, I'm about ready to go home. Those moments are the most important because you want the ones you love to get what's most important to you because you, cause you're caring about them and you want them to get what you think is most important for their life. Paul is communicating to Timothy here What's most important? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, if you remember, a little bit of history here. We went over this. We started the series on this. Paul went into great de- detail describing how bad things were going to get before Christ returns. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. Now, they didn't know when the, last, uh, the ultimate last days would be. I mean, it, technically, we've been the last days since Christ ascended up to heaven. But it's been 2,000 years. Okay, it's been 2,000 years. But you know what the Bible says. Paul, Peter also wrote this. A, a day is like a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years is like a day to the Lord. It's just like that. So in that respect, it's only been a couple of days since Christ went up to heaven. Nonetheless, the time is short. And, and, and God was speaking through the Apostle Paul saying, hey, before he comes back, before Jesus comes back, people are going to be really corrupt, those who don't know Christ. And he went on to say further that they're going to get to a place where they're not even going to endure listening to, to biblical teaching anymore. Right? Not, they will not endure sound doctrine, but they'll look for people, teachers will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They'll, remember, we, we read this. They'll forsake the truth and chase after myths. And so, we read all this, we see all that, and we think, you know, this really looks a lot like then what the Bible is. Yeah, it does. And so if that's the case, then how should it be? The neat thing is God is speaking through Paul. says, okay, when that happens, let me tell you what you need to live like. 
He culminated his description by saying to Timothy, he said, you know what, you need to be careful that you don't get caught up in all this stuff that's people getting traced off in other directions. You need to be faithful to God's word no matter what. You need to continue to preach it faithfully even when it's unpopular. You need to be, stay strong for Jesus and be sober-minded and be clear-headed even when it's going to be hard to because there's going to be so much stuff that's going to be hitting at you. you got to stay strong and resolute. And our current verse, verse 5, has several different things that Paul said needs to describe a person. And Paul's talking to Timothy right now as a pastor, that he's a pastor now, that most people believe was the Ephesian church. And, and, but he said, this is how you should be as a pastor, but also as a believer in Christ. How should you be? And yet, he, had, he, had se- he said several things in there, which we've already talked about. Uh, being straight with the word and being resolute. Uh, don't be afraid of suffering for Christ, even though it's, you know, it's going to be challenging. And he went on to say, you know what? Then he went on to say what we're talking about here. He said, verse, chapter 4, verse 5, our key part, verse 3 here says, work at telling others the good news. Now, different translations render this in different ways. New American Standard, ESV, and IV all say, render it this way. Do the work of an evangelist. New Century Version says it this way. Do the work of telling the good news. The Good News Bible says, do the work of the preacher of the good news. I appreciate Weiss. He's a, oh, he's a great biblical scholar. I really liked him a lot. He was really good at word studies. And he, he so, he, I, so I find it really intriguing. He, and he was fresh, how he, was, how he described things. And he was saying here, you know what? There's that word, he's using that word that frequently for evangelists that, like for example, in Ephesians chapter 4, about when God gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers for the equipment of God's people. What That word evangelist is the word here, and, you, and you people think, okay, so Paul's telling Paul, Peter, I mean, t- Paul's telling Timothy to be like an evangelist, like a, a professional evangelist. And, and we just saying, no, no, he's not doing that this time. He's saying, the situation here is, you see, yes, you're to be like an evangelist. You, see, because Timothy had been. Paul's talking to Timothy from a perspective of, together, Paul had in, uh, Timothy had, had uh, worked with Paul. They were doing the works of evangelists and starting new churches in different regions. He'd already been an evangelistic missionary. That was his work. He had a great part in that with the Apostle Paul. In fact, if you read other passages that describe how uh, when Paul was commending Timothy, he'd say, he, he, he does a lot to share the good news. He kept talking about that. Because that was a gift. In fact, Paul had already said earlier in, chap- in this first letter to Timothy, don't neglect this. And he also said in this letter too, don't neglect a gift. That evangelistic gift that was given to you. So he had the gift of evangelism, the, of evangelist, which is somebody whose calling is to point to Jesus and lead many people to Christ. That was their gifting. Evidently, Timothy was a pretty good evangelist, a pretty good at sharing and leading people to Jesus. But here's the deal. Now Timothy's in a place of a, of a more stable ministry. He's doing the work of a pastor. He's at the, again, most think, people think it was the Ephesian church. And so if that's the case, Paul was concerned about Timothy. He said, you know what I'm concerned about? Is that now you're taking care of a, a flock, and you're and they have needs as you're doing. You, I'm sure Timothy was a very caring person, so I'm sure he did a great job with that. But he said, I'm, my concern is you're going to be so dealing with a flock, you're going to forget, you're going to neglect that gift of do still being evangelistic. And that's what he's talking about here. You see. There's a difference, and this is what Weist talked about. There's a difference between having the gift of evangelism, of being an evangelist, but also every believer is still called to do the work of evangelism. That is sharing Jesus Christ. Right? Are you with me? And, that, and that's what Paul is telling Timothy in this particular passage. Don't neglect still sharing Jesus. I know you got this in ministry. You're taking care of the flock. And I'm sure you're doing a great job, Tim. Keep it up. But don't neglect... Even so, don't still don't neglect talking about Jesus with those who don't know him. And see, and that from that perspective, of course, that is an encouragement for all of us. What Paul is writing to Timothy, he's writing to all of us. And that is, you know what? I may not have the gift of evangelism. I may not, may not be that person whose ministry, whose calling, whose gifting is bringing who knows how many people to Jesus. But, I'm still called to do that work of evangelism where I'm supposed to still share Jesus. Amen? And that's, and that's what Paul's talking about here. 
every pastor should, should even though they're caring for the flock, is that as their responsibility, they should still not neglect sharing Jesus. Let me tell you something. Just on the, on the opening up, and if you were a part of our uh, mentorship class, group, you would know, or just around me and all, and if you would know that it's so hard. This is the thing that probably burdens me maybe more than anything else as a pastor. Because we're doing the work as we are called to do, ministering and loving on the people that God's called here. And that's a great need and a lot of work, obviously. But I don't want to be so doing that to the point where I don't even ever have an opportunity because it's very difficult because of the need's here that I never got a chance to share Jesus with anyone who's not here. Are, are you with me? And I think that burden should be for all of us. That's what Paul's saying to Timothy here. Never stop doing that work of sharing Christ, sharing the good news. And then it's especially true, he goes on to say, because the time is short. We're going to look at that a little bit. We should have an urgency in sharing Jesus because our time is short. Remember the context. He was talking about what the end, day, end times are going to look like. Big time, people are going to be really, really corrupt. It seems like they keep finding more and more ways to be corrupt in our day and age, don't they? Prophesied, man. Second Timothy chapter 3. And so, that being the case, we need to work, seeing our time is short, we need to share Jesus all the more. Look with me at, at Romans chapter 13, verses 11 and 12. Paul says this. This is all the more urgent. Interesting, he was talking about loving people here. For you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up! For our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds, the like dirty clothes, and put on the shining armor of right living. So now Paul is talking here about the importance, the, right before that he talked about the importance of loving each other, and, this, and at the end of it he talks about the importance of holy living, trying to live right. But his point is, either way, he's saying, you know what? Our time is short. We need to be urgent. We're seeing where we're at. We're seeing how things are at. We see that, don't we? He's, I mean, think about it. Paul saw that back 2,000 years ago. How much more now? And so here's the deal. We see that. We know the time is short. So he's saying, get urgent. Wake up, brothers and sisters. Our, our salvation is almost here. We need to be about the Father's business. And of course, there's no greater need when we think about urgency than sharing Christ whenever possible. We need to develop a sense of real sense of urgency when it comes to sharing the Lord because the time is running out. We can't live like we have forever in this life and this world's going to last forever because we know it's not going to. The scriptures are clear. The world, as we know, it's not going to last forever. In fact, the Bible says when Christ returns, he's going to destroy the heavens and earth as we know it yes. with fervent fire and all the elements. Is this, he's going to create a new heaven, a new earth where righteousness dwells. That's what the word of God says. And so if that's the case, let's stop hanging to this life it's like it's all there is. Amen? Amen? We need to live like this life is not. It's just the hors d'oeuvre, man. We haven't had the main course yet. Amen? Amen. The main course is what we heard about during communion time. Amen? Amen. That's, that's, that, that's the main course. Praise God for that. Thank you again. That's a say for that meditation. Amen. Amen, brother. Thank you. Well, let's look a little bit more. Let's look a little more, more about this concept of urgency and, and how it should, therefore, we need to make the most of our time. Look at me in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. Paul says this, Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Boy, are these days not evil. Amen? Make every opportunity to share Christ. And he, he, he elaborates even further on this in Colossians 4, 5, and 6. He said, Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so you will have the right response for everyone. <laughs> this means we, we need to be sharing Jesus at every opportunity we can. Make the most of every situation because the time is short. That's what Paul is saying. That's what the whole point is. We can say it like this. The time is short. Share Christ's report. <laughs> Amen? Amen? The time is short. Share Christ's report. Of course, for Christ's report, we mean the good news of Jesus. Can you guys say that in the count of three? 
One, two, three. The time is short. Share Christ's report. Yeah, let's share the good news of Jesus. The time is short. We need to we need to share his love. We need to share the message of salvation. The time is short. Share Christ's report. In Revelation, the Bible says that the devil is going on a rampage because he knows his time is short. Romans, I mean, excuse me, Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. Look at this. It says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who live in the heavens rejoice. But terror will come on earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing that he has little time. So here's the deal. The devil's on a, going on a rampage because he knows his time is short. I think we're seeing that more and more. I, I'm going to tell you this. I'm, Lonnie's, Lonnie's going to open up just here a second here a little bit. We see the devil working in so many different ways. We see him working in individual lives. I'll be honest with you. I, th- I see him working in politics. It seems like people aren't even caring about people anymore. Political parties are all about so many of them in there. So many people in leadership are all about staying in power and doing things. And it's not about the people, even though they say that. Are you with me on that? All I'm trying to say is, we see the devil work in so many different ways. And individuals and government. And, you know, everywhere. Media, everything. In academia. It's, it's hard. We, in fact, you and I can see that so much, it can seem overwhelming. Overwhelming, can't it? Can it? Yes. Praise God, we're still on the winning side, brothers and sisters. Amen. Don't, don't, I, I, we're tempted if you overcome, but you're not alone. You're not alone. He's there with you. And he really, oh, he actually has already overcome. It doesn't look like it right now, but he's already overcome. Amen? He has. That's called East. That's called the resurrection. Amen? He conquered hell. He conquered death. He conquered sin. And he gave us new life through that wonderful, wonderful conquering of hell and death. The devil's on death row right now. He's waiting for the ultimate throne being thrown in the lake of fire. Really, that's what's happening. But he knows his time is short. Okay, well, maybe a better way of saying it, he's out on bail. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. Right? He's trying to do as much damage as he can before he finally gets it all. Amen? That's what's going on. But what's, the, here's the deal. We're, we've already won. Oh, there's so much more we're going to share about this. The time is short, though. So we need to share Christ's report. Recently, I was so blessed. Shortly before my mom and dad went back up to Idaho, my mom read this uh, Facebook post. And it was such a blessing to me because it was um, from somebody who was special to me. They were part of our church that we had served before we came here in Washington. And we had brought, brought him to Christ. I had the wonderful privilege of baptizing him into Jesus and he and his wife, and then I actually married, I married them. And they were mentored and became active in the church on the small group I led. I mean, obviously really important to me. Very touching. Just thinking about, you know. And he wrote this. He understand that he came from a very tough background. I won't go into all of it. Just, I'll just, I'll just leave it like that. And so coming to Christ, and there's a whole new thing. He didn't know much about Jesus and church or Bible or anything. And so, you know, it was a learning curve for him. But he stuck with it. And getting involved and getting mentored and everything, he, he grew. And recently, well, he wrote this on his Facebook post. My mom read it, and I found it later. I'm just going to read. I'm going to read what he said. It, he said this, I blows my mind on how the world is becoming crazier each passing day. It's, it scares me at the same time, but more than ever, I'm so glad for God's grace. If you don't know him yet, please, I ask you to search for Jesus. He's my Savior. He could be your Savior as well. You just need to believe that he died for your sins and accept that you can't do this alone. I can't do this alone. I need him in my life. 
We live on borrowed time in this day and age. But think of it like this. When you're a, like, use a spray bottle and use it, watch how fast it disappears. We, in the same way, are there one minute and we're gone the next. It's important that we seek Jesus Christ. I prayed this morning on my way to work, praying that more and more people will come to the Lord. Even my family that I've been praying for years to come to the Lord now, to hear the good news. Because God's always good. I've been praying also for my son's mother and stepfather for, the, for years now. I just hope that one day they will all come to the Lord. God is always good. God's word is forever. I can't tell you how much of a blessing that was. <laughs> Knowing where he came from and where he's at now. Did you see here our friend, how he opened his post? He opened it by saying, it blows my mind how this world is becoming crazier each passing day. He also said we live on borrowed time, didn't he? But then he said, if you don't know him yet, please, I ask you to search for Jesus. He's my Savior. He can be your Savior as well. Our Christian brother had already made the connection we've been talking about in this series, and especially today. And that is, the time is short, so we need to share, we need to share Christ's report. <sighs> Recently, some about a month ago, our friend also posted this. Listen to this, what he said on, just a month ago. The Lord has truly blessed me this week on how patient he is with me and how encouraging it has been, especially sharing the gospel with my new co-worker that I have been training up in my line of work and strengthening his faith further. Truly, this is doing God's work and I couldn't ask for anything else. I am excited for this man. Wow. My friend's excited for his co-worker because he realizes if that person does receive Jesus, he knows what's in store for him and he's excited about that for him. And I'm excited for my friend. Because his passion for Jesus is just, he's come so far and it's just so encouraging. And honestly, I'm a bit humbled. It's been a long time since I, I don't, I'm not a Facebooker. I've tried at times and then I just, I get overwhelmed by it. <clears throat> so it's been a long time since I shared a post like that on Facebook. I had done it before, but way back, you know. And it's just so encouraging to hear my friend do that. You might think, well, that's a little hard, you know, because what do people think? I, I kind of want to become tough too preachy. My friend was just being loving and kind and caring for some people that he knew we needed to know Jesus. He was just opening himself up. How could they not accept that? And if they don't, then that's on them. Amen? He wasn't being, I, you knew heard it. He wasn't being mean in any way. He was just being loving and sharing his thoughts. I think it's a time. Preston, I've, we shared a little before how you get bold on Cora, an online site, and we're so blessed by that. I think it's now, it's time for us brothers and sisters to be bold as believers in sharing Jesus. By bold, I don't mean insensitive. I mean, but just meaning being intentional and proactive and passionate. For example, how, what my friend did on Facebook. The time is short, we need to share Christ's report. The time is short, share Christ's report. Well, how do we do it? How do you and I share Jesus with urgency and passion? How do we do it? I'm going to give you five things, five different principles we can see in Scripture. One, they're going to become a little bit kind of rapid fire. You, by the way, if you don't know, I've been, there's a little fill in the blanks thing if you haven't been doing it already. And these are the five points. So how do I share Jesus with urgency and passion? How do I share, how do I share Christ's report? One, by keeping Jesus soon return in the forefront of my mind. By keeping his, oh God, his return in the forefront of my mind. Colossians 4, 5 says, Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Romans 13, 11, sorry, says, This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. I'm sorry, okay. I got a little touched up a little bit from my reading my things for my friend and I have to blow my nose a little bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Wake up for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. 
keeping our heads in the, at, on the fact that our time is really short can help us keep that urgency and that passion to share Christ no matter what. Another way I can share Jesus' urgency with urgency and passion is by relying on Christ overcoming death to help me overcome. This is a little powerful thing. Actually, we talked about this. It's kind of cool. Re- uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And they have defeated him. The, time, the him is the devil here. And they, and the, they are believers in Christ. They have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb. The him, of course, is the devil, and is defeated by the followers of Christ who will overcome him by three means. And this is talking about the first mean. The first and most important way we overcome the devil is through the shed blood of Jesus. The overcoming through Christ's death and resurrection has two effects. And this is really interesting. This is what we talked about. Really interesting. One, and this is what part we know, maybe, but we don't want to lose sight of. Christ's death and resurrection overcame the power of my sin and conquered it. As a result of Christ's death, you and I receive salvation and forgiveness of sins. His conquering of our sins happens when we receive Christ by faith. This happens, this is called the first first resurrection, your spiritual resurrection. You know when that happens? When you say yes to Jesus Christ in your heart. If you know Jesus Christ, you've already been resurrected spiritually. Did you know that? You are a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. Amen? Oh, man, we should be excited about that. Amen? Amen. Oh, we're getting there, but we got to get closer. Amen. Amen. All right. (laughs) But there's a second resurrection. And we overcome the devil through the second resurrection too. And that's the physical death. Think about this for a moment. When Jesus died, three days later, he, re- he resurrected and conquered. He became physically, his body was resurrected. Now it was changed, but it was his body that was changed and it was made a, a glorified body, but the same body that was glorified. Amen? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Same with us. You see, the devil thought he had beaten Jesus until he hadn't. Amen? Amen? Three days later, uh-oh, he's alive, he's alive. Woohoo, right? Yes. Same with you and me. If Christ calls us home first, oh, the devil might think he's winning. Uh-uh. When Christ comes back again, guess what happens? Our bodies go, woo we got a resurrected body, amen? A glorified, resurrected, physical body. So we conquer the devil even with our physical, conquer physical death by beating him, amen? All because of Jesus Christ and our putting our faith in him. The second resurrection. Praise God for that. Amen. So the point is you can't lose if you know Jesus Christ. <laughs> you beat him spiritually, you beat him physically. And by the way, right now, because we, we have the Holy Spirit in us, we beat him through the power of the Spirit even now. That's called prayer. Amen? Yes. Amen. We are more than conquerors, as it says in Romans 8, through Christ who loves us. Yes. Okay. I know we're going to get going, so I'm going to keep on going. What's the third way that we can learn, that we can maintain a sense of urgency and passion in sharing Jesus or Christ's report? How do I do that? By not letting the fear of suffering hinder my effort to share Jesus. Oh, the devil likes to use fear. This is interesting, though. I want you to take a look at this. In our, in our current passage, it says in 2 Timothy 4, 5, he says, Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news. The, he said, work at telling others the good news. It was right on the heels of him saying, Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. If we were to ask, what would be the number one reason, do you think, why we don't share Christ more? Because we could if we wanted to. We'd be afraid of, we're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of something's going to happen to us. They won't accept us. It'll hurt our relationship. You know, who knows what they're going to do. How, how it will react. And how it will affect other people. Fear, right? Yes. And Paul just said, don't be afraid of that. He said, what's well, easier said than done, Paul? Well, guess what? Guess what? Okay, we'll look at a couple other verses and he's going to talk about how we can help with that. Look at Revelation 12, 11. They did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. You know, if you're not afraid to die, the devil has nothing on you. And we don't have to fear death, do we? Paul said, hey, it's for him to die was gain. Didn't he say that? 
Why? Because we're going to be in that wonderful dwelling place called mansion up in the sky. Amen? Amen. So we have nothing to fear if we really believe what we say we believe. Right? So if we don't fear death, the devil can't do nothing to you because all he can do is kill your body. He can't kill your soul. He's already been resurrected. But guess what? Eventually, you're going to beat him with your body being resurrected too. Right? Either way, all the way, he cannot we beat you. We just can't believe the lies from the enemy. So if we don't fear death, the devil can't do anything to you because you will overcome. You will be bold. You'll keep sharing Jesus and the devil can't do anything but run then. God will help us overcome our fears. But look, oh, this is so deep. Catch this. Look at this very next. Oh, this is something you may not have seen before. Or paid attention to it. We're going to pay attention right now. I know the time, but oh. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Look at this. This is that we read that one verse quite a bit, verse 7. In fact, we've done that a couple of times in this series. But we don't couple it with this context. Look at me at 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 8. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. Right? We know this one. But a power, love, and self-discipline. God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, t- being timid. Power, love, and self-discipline. Oh, we love that verse. But we don't read, but we stop reading it right there. What's Paul say right after that? So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. Ooh. Paul was talking, when he was talking about God not giving us a spirit of fear, he was talking in the context, so don't be afraid about sharing Jesus. Because God gives you Power, love, self-control. He's going to give you the power to overcome. You know what this is saying? This is saying you don't have to fear because God's going to give you what you need when you need it. Amen. That's what this is saying. Amen. He's God. If you trust Him, you take, you take a walk. You're a Peter now. You're walking out of the boat. Oh, Lord, I can't do this. You're right. You can't do it on your own, but you're not on your own anymore. I'm with you, and you're doing my work. I will sustain you. I am with you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen? Yes. I will hold you up. So don't be afraid of ever sharing Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed of telling others about our Lord. Okay. Another way I can share Jesus with urgency and passion is by, just two more, the second to last one here, living a God-honoring, kind, and attractive life. <laughs> this is a great verse. Colossians 4, 5, and 6. First part, in the verse 6. Live wisely among those who are not believers... Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so you will have the right response for everyone. I love, you know what's so really cool about that verse? It's saying you don't have to be weird and obnoxious to share Christ. That's what this is saying. This is saying, hey, you know what? You can actually be kind and, and thoughtful and attractive and sharing, you can make the gospel look attractive. Hallelujah, because it is attractive. Amen? Amen. It's called good news. Amen? Amen? Not bad news, good news. The bad news is what it is without Jesus Christ. But with Jesus Christ, we have all things in Christ. Amen? Amen. Yes. It's great news. And we can make it attractive. He wants us to. You don't have to be obnoxious. Sometimes we feel like well, if I have to share Jesus, I have to do something stupid. You know, whatever. Look weird and share weird and have a Bible that's bigger than you or whatever. I don't know. And tell them, well, you know, we've seen the things like that. We feel like we have to be that way or we're not doing it right. No, this is saying be attractive. And uh, Peter said, do a gentleness and reverence. Be kind. It's great news. Isn't that cool? Isn't that exciting to know that? Come on. Isn't it exciting that you can be kind in sharing Jesus? You can be sensitive to them. Isn't that good? All right. Last one. How else can I share Jesus with urgency and passion? By sharing what Jesus has done for me and can do for others or for them. Revelation 12, 11, first and last part of it says, And they defeated him, the devil, by their testimony... Their testimony, their personal testimony, they defeated the devil by sharing what Christ had done for them. What Jesus told that Gadarene demoniac when he had set him free from the legion of demons, he wanted to follow Jesus, but Jesus told him this in Mark 5, 19, 20, he said, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. 
And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis, the ten towns, how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Let me say something. But what about if you don't know where you're at with Jesus yet? What about if you, do you know, if I I die right now, would I even go to heaven? It's all about asking him in your heart and your life. Giving your life to Jesus. Believing that he died in, to conquer your sin and death. And he resurrected to conquer hell on your behalf. So if you ask him into your life, he's already conquered death and hell and sin for you. You just receive him in. So he takes away that sin and he takes away that penalty of death. And now you have eternal life. Wow. Is it that simple? Yeah, it is. Now it's not always easy to live for him because people don't agree with us. But that's okay. The receiving is easy. And we, he'll help us to do the living. Now, also, and I, I like to invite everyone. Um, I'm going to mention our new Friends Cafe afterwards. Hope you can be a part of that if you're new. But also next week we're having our Discovering God class. And we hope that uh, you can take that next week if you have any questions. I, you have your questions answered there. Uh, Martin Niemerler, a theologian and a pastor during the time of Hitler in Germany. There was a couple of phenomenal pastors and theologians back then. You might be aware. But Martin Niemöller was one of them, Dr. Martin Niemöller. I didn't know about this, though. I just learned it this week. He was arrested in prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus. He didn't compromise, and so Hitler had him arrested. But catch this. I didn't know this. Did you know that Hitler actually had a 30-minute, like, discussion time with Niemöller? They had a one-on-one time. And Hitler was trying to get Niemöller to forsake his commitment to the gospel of Jesus and instead to preach Nietzscheism, which is everything's, well, there is no God, essentially. And you know, it's all about living for number one. And Anyways, uh, you know, everything's, it's, it's a feudalistic view of life. And Niemöller didn't. He, but he argued from, an, from a philosophical perspective why he would not believe in Nietzscheism. He said, I'm, no, I'm, I'm going to stay with my Christian faith. And so Hitler put him in prison. Years later, Niemöller was released from prison. And he testified that he had visions that haunted him still. He dreamed, he said, he had dreams like this. He said he dreamed that he, he saw Hitler standing before the judgment seat of God. And Niemöller was standing off to the side uh, watching the panorama of events. So he's seeing God judge Hitler and Niemöller's there standing on the side watching it. In his vision, he saw Christ turn to Hitler and he said, what's your excuse for all your crimes? In reply, Hitler says, well, no one told me the gospel. Niemöller said he he wasted 30 minutes arguing philosophy with Hitler and he never told him specifically about the love of Jesus Christ. May all of us say with our heart, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. The time is short. We need to share Christ's report. Folks, we can get so caught up in everything else that are important stuff, but we neglect the most important, Jesus we can deal with other stuff as it comes. But we need to focus on Jesus. Jesus. The world needs Jesus. Jesus. So often we, we are like Martin Niemöller. We get on true stuff, but not the most important. The time is short. We need to share Christ's report. Let's pray. Father God, the time is short. We see it. Lord, you made it clear even through the Apostle Paul way back then. He said, the day is dawning. The time for our salvation is even nearer now than when we first believed. That's certainly true for us even today.
Lord Jesus, you have given us, you give your people insight. A lot of times, Father, we, we, we marvel. It's like, can't people see? Why can't they see what's going on around them? But Lord, they have that veil, that, those bl that blinders over their eyes that you talked about, Lord, in 2 Corinthians. It's only when we put our faith in you that you take away that veil, those blinders, and all of a sudden the scales from our, fall from our eyes and we can see. And yet, Lord, the worst, the hard part of this is most people still have that veil over their eyes because they haven't yet surrendered to Jesus. And maybe part of it's, Lord, is because we just haven't shared Christ's report yet like we should. Help us, O oh Lord. We know the time is short. We got to share Christ's report. There's no greater time than right now. No more urgent time than right now. Lord, as believers in Jesus, there's no more important time than right, right now. And I know, Lord, you want to use us you want to work through us, we just have to be willing to join you. Lord, I'm going to ask forgiveness right now in Jesus' name. Lord, forgive us when we haven't maybe felt the urgency as we should. That, that we haven't, Lord, uh, done what you said in your word. The time is near. <laughs> Lord, forgive us, Lord, when we, when we act like this life is all there is, even though we know it's not. Oh, Lord, and, and forgive us. The enemy, Lord, is a great accuser. And he gets us thinking about how bad we are. And so we don't deserve to share Christ because who are we? But, Lord, it's not about how great we are. It's about how awesome you are. You did it for us. Our salvation is all because of what you did for us. And us saying yes. And there's a whole lot of people, Lord, that still need to say yes to the Savior. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that you would put in our hearts and minds the urgency and the passion. The time is short. Lord, we need to share Christ's report. Help us, God, to do that. I pray for every one of us. Lord God, that you would put our hearts on fire that we would focus on your return soon and that we've done all that we can and someday, Lord, when we come before you, that we know that we did everything we could, that we didn't hide, Lord, the good news and bury it somewhere, that we shared Jesus wherever we could. Lord, there's people that need Jesus. They're suffering and they don't know they need you, Lord. Lord, help us to be there for them. Help us to love them enough to share Jesus. Help us to be patient enough and help us to pray for them, Lord God. Put in our hearts, Lord God, a love for people, a love for the lost, Lord, the same love that you have for them, a love that's willing to leave the 99 for the one. Lord, we need to share Christ's report. Lord, we need the urgency. We know we do. Help us, oh God. Work through us, Lord, to do that. We can't do it on our own, God. But we're not on our own. And we come against the enemy who wants to get us to believe that we are. We have you in us. I pray for everyone here. I pray for everyone online, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that we all, Lord God, would renew ourselves again even today and every day. Lord God, we know the time is short, so we need to share Christ's report. We fall before you, O oh God. Help us to care more for others than our own conveniences. We love you, God. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.